But good to have you here. Good to be with you again. And uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll jump into our study this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for how wonderful you are and uh, for your marvelous grace to us. Um, and we know we don't deserve it, and that's what grace is about. We just thank you that you do all the saving. We do only all the being saved. And we thank you that uh, our sins were taken away at Calvary. And the only thing you're waiting on anyone to do today is just to take you at your word that your son put those sins away all by himself. We thank you for that. We thank you for the joining to the Holy Spirit and uh, the Holy Spirit rather joining us to your son at the moment we trust what happened for us at Calvary with our sins. And, uh, and then we have his righteousness on our account. We just thank you so much. What a plan you had. What a marvelous God you are. Thank you for the message today and for the people who've come to share it with me. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to do something uh, we did last week. We were in the book of Romans, as you recall. We're going to return there again this morning. And um, if we were looking at Romans as though it were a corner, a, a slab, a foundation slab, as you see there, you're looking down on a slab, you'll see that this book can be divided into four different sections. I like to call them cornerstones, as though we uh, were looking down upon that foundation again. And that's as it should be because Romans is a foundational epistle when it comes to the doctrine of faith. Uh, the Romans foundation has four cornerstones, as you can see, and the first cornerstone, Romans 1 through chapter 5, is a cornerstone called justification. In those first five chapters, uh, we learn why we needed to be justified, along with the doctrine of how we are justified, the details of, of being given a gift uh, declaration of the righteousness of God himself, uh, the moment we place our faith in what Christ accomplished when he died for our sins at Calvary. Um, so this is not a righteousness that anyone could ever earn, or it wouldn't be called grace, it's certainly not a righteousness that any of us could ever deserve. It's a gift decree. We were freely decreed to be as righteous as God himself, simply by believing what his son accomplished when he died for our sins at Calvary. Uh, so don't believe a message that says you need to accomplish that. He died to put away sins, and your sins were put away at Calvary, not any other time in your life. So you were forgiven your sins before you ever drew a breath. He's not been waiting for anyone to be forgiven their sins. He's been waiting for us to come to learn what he did at, at, at Calvary and then rejoice in what he's done. So in the second cornerstone of Romans, now that's chapter 6, verse 1 through chapter 8. The remainder, uh, that's the remainder of the second cornerstone, but that second cornerstone is about our sanctified position. Uh, we are sanctified, which simply means set apart, given a brand new identity. That's how God set us apart. We can set ourselves apart from certain things. Now that's called self-sanctification. Uh, but God has already set us apart by placing us into his son and crediting his son's righteousness to our account. So we're already sanctified in that sense. sense. We've all been saved from our sins at Calvary. Uh, again, um, it's now just God waiting for humanity to learn and for us to share with folks what happened at Calvary when our sins were paid for by Christ. He put them away. So like our justification... Our sanctification, or our set-apartness came not through any of our doing, uh, but through a spiritual operation performed by the Holy Spirit himself. The moment we placed our faith, the moment we decided to take God at his word concerning what Christ did at Calvary, which resolved the sin issue there, taking it off the table of God's justice forever, the Holy Spirit made us a part of Christ himself by placing us into Christ. It's an expression Paul used 104 times in his letters, if I've counted properly. By the way, Paul used marriage imagery here on earth to show us that we've become one with Christ, uh, a union so intricate, so complete, that God considers uh, us to be members of Christ's body, of his flesh, and of his bones. He consider, considers us to be one with Christ. So our apostle tells us over in the book of Ephesians that the believer's union with a spouse down here on earth is to be a picture of that oneness believers enjoy in our union with the Savior. Um, so when we come to the final portion of the sanctification cornerstone, we find one of the most exciting verses, I believe, to be found anywhere in the Word of God. I want to read it in two different sections so that we can follow the text on the screen with me. And for those who are watching this lesson, you'll be able to see the verses. We'll begin with section 1, chapter 8, verses 31 and through 34. Here it is. Paul writes here, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, 
but delivered him up for us all, how shall he, God the Father, not with him, Jesus Christ, also freely give us all things? Put simply, believers are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What is his belongs to us. Isn't that amazing? Now, verses 33 and 34. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now, the second section and the final uh, the final portion of the sanctification cornerstone is chapters 8, verses 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who can separate us from Christ? Nothing in the past, nothing in the present, and nothing in the future can separate us. That includes sins, because they were done away, they were put away at Calvary. These are nine powerful verses that form a beautiful summation of all that Paul's already revealed when it comes to our justified standing and sanctified position in Christ Jesus. The three words found in verse 37 are the best title that could be given this lesson. We believers are more than conquerors, which means we're more than triumphant. Uh, we're more than champions. You can say it in any number of ways. We're, we're more than triumphant. We're more than champions. We're more than winners. We're more than victors. You could add to that list. We're more than all of those things because we're more than conquerors. All these ideas are wrapped up in Paul's summation statement when he reviews the details of Christ's accomplishment at Calvary on our behalf. Uh, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, Paul said. Do you believe that you are more than a conqueror as you're hearing this lesson today? Do you feel like you're more than a conqueror as you're hearing this lesson today? Um, if someone were to walk up to you and say, who do you think you are? Would you take that negatively or positively? Be here next week for that lesson. Who do you think you are? <laughs> if you don't feel like you're more than a conqueror as you sit here today or as anyone outside hearing in, then this message is designed especially for you. Just prior to our text today, Paul said in this well-known verse, Romans chapter, verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That's the good circumstances and the bad circumstances. That's all that's happened wonderfully in your life and all that turned your world upside down. They work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. It's interesting that when we think about the call that God sends out to all unbelievers through his written word, um, an invitation to lay self-ability aside, simply trust in the finished cross work of his son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when it comes to having saved the world of sinners from our sins that he bore, on himself at Calvary. Uh, he took human, humanity's place. It's a vicarious death. He died in our stead. Well, that word call is also used in reference to believers, not just unbelievers. Believers are called according to his purpose for us, Paul's told us. The word translated call or called is a form of the Greek kaleo. You might see it there on the screen, kaleo. It's a very strong word that we might think of as actually being a summons. A summons is much more than a call. As you probably know, a summons is more than a simple invitation. Um, we might think of kaleo in the sense of a court summons because that's what a summons is. That's an appropriate way to portray God's call to believers because the Apostle Paul used judicial language in the final verses of chapter 8. He's taking us into a courtroom. Since Paul presents that idea, let's think in those terms for just a few minutes. Think in terms of the judicial system. We know it always doesn't come out like we think it should or which would be we would attribute to be fair. But the judicial system nonetheless, that shouldn't be too difficult for most of us because as you know, we're living in a time when litigation is as commonplace as a common cold, is it not? Um, 
when lawyers and attorneys have their billboards all across the nation telling you what they're going to do and how much money they're going to get you. Um, some are called to court for jury duty. Anyone here ever called to jury duty? I have, twice. Um, some go to testify on behalf of another person. Um, some go to court to press their own claims. And some go to court to defend themselves against the claims of others made against them. Uh, in fact, insurance companies prompt us to prepare for the likelihood that at some point in time we're going to find ourselves in a court of law. And even if you don't happen to end up in a court yourself, we're living in a time, as you know, when we can all witness the legal system at work right in the privacy of our own homes. Uh, the idea of cameras in the courtroom was born in 1991. But who does not remember the slow speed chase of the white Ford Bronco? Uh, how many watched that in here? Anybody? Oh, just about everybody. Um, we're told that 91 million Americans watched O.J. Simpson surrender as he pulled into his Brentwood driveway. His public trial began in January 1995, and that was the largest and most watched trial and it was OJ every day, all day. Cameras were continuously filming and viewers watching. So many were on hand watching as the charges were being leveled. We could watch the prosecution build its case. We could see the defense um, as the charges were leveled. We could witness firsthand the jury render as the jury rendered that verdict. And we could even be in the courtroom via the media industry to watch as sentencing was passed on OJ Simpson and, and uh, and we watched him walk. So most everyone is acquainted, in some sense, with the judicial system when it comes to courtroom proceedings. Most of us know that the judicial system was designed to bring justice to play when wrongs are committed, right? Now, it doesn't always work, as I said. It always doesn't work that way. Not always, but that's what it was designed to do. And the roots of our legal system go way back in time. Uh, did you know that many of the items we find in our judi judicial system today, if I can ever say that word and get it all the way out, are basically biblical in origin? Many of the laws and the regulations, even some of the practices that we find in our modern day courtrooms were taken right out of scripture. It's an historical fact that the framers of our constitution originally designed our laws around the principles found in the word of God. How have we departed that today? Let me give you some examples. Where do you suppose the death penalty came from? Biblical law. Deuteronomy 17, 6. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. Even the fact that witnesses are required in legal matters is based on biblical, biblical law. No matter how much it's altered from that today, it's, it was based on that. Deuteronomy 19, 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Witnesses are called today, aren't they? They're summoned to come to court. Who determines the sentence or the penalty once a jury finds the defendant guilty? Well, that's who it was that ordained judges in the first place. <laughs> It was God, was it not? God ordained judges throughout the, court, uh, throughout the course of Israel's history. It was God that ordained judges in the first place. There are other similarities as well, but the most interesting tidbit that I came across was the fact that the judges were originally given robes to wear because that was the garment of the priesthood in that day. And what they were trying to do was to give the judge more of an aura of authority when he appeared. And the priesthood wore, they wore robes. Seems that the people in early church days recognized spiritual authority. So the idea was if you dress the judge up to look like the priest, the judge would receive more respect. So judges wear robes. <laughs> of course, in our day, the judges have kept the robes, and many of the fundamental pastors have abandoned that mode of dress to emphasize the fact that, quote, unquote, the clergy is no different than people out in the pews. We're all the same today. God looks on all believers as equally important in whatever role they happen to play in the body of Christ. Um, well, given the similarities we've just mentioned between American law and biblical law, shouldn't surprise us then that when we come to across a courtroom scene being described in Scripture, it should look very familiar to us. They remind us somewhat of the courtroom scene we might expect on our own country. I'll give you a couple examples of these. 
Some commentators bring up Daniel chapter 7 as a courtroom scene. The individual who's on trial there is an anti or false Christ. And when we look at this section, we can draw some parallels with some of the things we might expect to see in the courtroom today. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, the judge himself comes in and he takes his seat behind the bench. Look at it with me. As the prophet Daniel writes in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. Who's the ancient of days spoken of here? This is a reference to none other than the Lord God himself. He is the judge in this courtroom prophecy. If you think about this, you can just imagine in your mind's eye the judge coming in, taking his seat. He sits down just as the ancient of days did sit in preparation for the sentence that he's about to pass down. You can almost hear the words, all rise, as the judge comes in, right? Look at the way this judge is described, whose garment was white as snow and hair of his head like the pure wool, obviously a reference to the holiness of this judge. Now in British law, what do the judges wear on their heads? Wigs, as you know. Daniel goes on, his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Commentators agree that the fiery flame mentioned here and the wheels as burning fire are symbols of God's wrath and his justice. Psalms 97.3 says, A fire goeth before him, and he burneth up his enemies round about. So this judge is not only ready to pass a sentence in this verse, he's fully capable of executing the justice this sentence requires. As he's taken his position in the courtroom, notice verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. As the justice clock ticks, the Antichrist is ready to be judged as he stands before the sitting judge, the Ancient of Days, in this passage. Again, you can imagine, as with the courtroom scene today, the defendant being asked, do you have any final words to speak on your own behalf before I pass judgment? Verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. It's interesting, when we come down to the remainder of this verse, the Antichrist words are definitely going to be used against him. <laughs> what you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And the one that's being judged here, his words are going to be used against him. Um, so the gavel comes down as the judge passes sentence. Daniel proceeds with his vision of the results of the sentence. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So all in this one scene, we have the judge, we have the verdict, and we have the actual execution portrayed right in front of us. Well, another legal examination is going to take place right here in the book of Romans that we're in right now. It's back in the early chapters, but, uh, but you'll recall the events as we go back and we re review them for you. Uh, this time, the whole world is on trial. Watch as the proceedings are about to get underway. The Apostle Paul's working his way through each major section of the population of the world. He begins first with the Gentiles in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Hold, hold, hold the truth in what's the next word? Unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. We're told that creation itself was enough for God to pass sentence, for the ancient of days to pass sentence on, on the uh, Gentiles early on. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, are what? Without excuse. The verdict has been rendered. The Gentiles were guilty. So Paul moves on to the Jews, and he proves they're equally guilty in verses 23 and 24. Thou that makest thy boast of the law. Who would that be? The people of Israel. Through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as is written. So as far as the whole world is concerned, Jews and Gentiles alike, Paul draws his conclusion in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we Gentiles any better than they? No in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. What's the verdict? 
guilty. Now the conclusion that's drawn against the entire world is that all are guilty of sin. Romans 3.23. In Romans chapter 8, the section of scripture I chose as our home text this morning, we have one more courtroom scene to visit. The Antichrist is not on trial in this case. It's not even the whole world who are on trial here. But it's you and it's me on trial in the rest of this chapter. We believers are on trial here. In verses 31 through 39 of Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is going to reach four conclusions concerning us believers as we stand before the Lord in Paul's courtroom analogy. The Antichrist was found guilty. The world consisting of Jews and Gentiles alike was found guilty. Now picture yourself in the courtroom, the courtroom of God's justice and you as a believer are the one that's on trial. That's the picture Paul's painting for us. It's an analogy that he's presenting in these verses. Let me give you the first conclusion that Paul draws as, he begins to work, as we begin to work our way through our home text. Here it is. For the believer, there is no effective opposition. Number one. Conclusion number one for the believer is that there is no effective opposition. You're in the courtroom. And there's no effective opposition. Now let's walk our way through it. Again, you're in the courtroom of God's justice. Picture yourself standing there. Again, you are, you are in the courtroom. You are anxiously awaiting the judge. Finally, the judge, God himself, it's an analogy, of course, enters the room and the words ring out. All arise. Can you see it? Picture it. You're standing there. There you are. The judge takes his seat behind the bench and all eyes are focused on him. You could hear a pin drop in this courtroom. The silence is deafening in itself. As the judge takes his seat, you remain standing because you are the one on trial. What will be the conclusion as far as you are concerned? Suddenly the apostle stands up, the apostle Paul, looks around the courtroom and he breaks the silence with the statement he makes in verse 21. What shall we then say to these things? What things is he talking about? Well, he's talking about all the things he's given us up to this point in the book of Romans. He's talking about the fact that we have sinned and we're continually sinning. For all have sinned and are coming short of the glory of God. That includes every one of us. No use denying that. He's also talking about the fact that God has provided a way for everyone to be justified or declared righteous by the way of a gift decree from God. Our justification comes through, what's the next word? It begins with F. Faith. When we place our faith in Christ's faith cross work into what it accomplished, he died for our sins, he died in our place, he was made to be sin in our place, that he was buried, putting those sins, putting them away forevermore, and that he rose again on the third day for our justification, the Holy Spirit performed a spiritual surgery on us by placing us into, joining us to the person of Christ himself. Paul's talking about the fact that there is now no condemnation to them who are which, in, which are in Christ Jesus. We now have peace with God because, because of all those things Paul's told us. These are the all things Paul has in mind as he says, what shall we then say to these things? We've been freely declared to be righteous uh, as we are set apart in Christ Jesus at the point of our belief. What shall we then say to these things? Of course, Paul answers that question himself in the remainder of the verse. What does he say? If God be for us, who can be against us? And you're in the court of his justice here in Paul's analogy. Think about what Paul's saying here. Who was it that came in and took a seat behind the bench? Well, it was the judge, wasn't it? The supreme judge of the universe in this analogy, God himself. There's no court more supreme. You couldn't go to a to a supreme court that would be higher than this court. There is no court more supreme than the court you are in as you're standing here on trial. Appeals would not only be useless, they'd be totally impossible because you are standing in the highest court in the universe, not in the land, in the universe. And you know what Paul just told you? He just told you that the judge is on your side. How would you like to be in a courtroom, because you are here, and have the judge be on your side? Would you feel pretty confident? Can you imagine hearing that? Can you imagine, imagine the position that puts you in? What better words could you possibly hear if you were standing in that kind of a courtroom? Well, Paul's telling us here to relax and to listen because the judge is on your side. And there isn't anything underhanded or dishonest about it. It's all above board. 
We're going to find out why it's above board in a few minutes, but the fact is the Apostle Paul is looking over all the evidence, and after taking all things into account, he is saying, God is for you. God is for you. And if God is for you, the logical conclusion is who can possibly be against you? No one. Nothing and no one. Who is above God? For someone to be against you, the believer, they would have to be against God, would they not? Because he's for you. <laughs> and who is higher than God? God is El Elyon in Scripture, El Elyon, the most high God, the most high judge in Paul's analogy here. In the court of God's justice, there's no effective opposition for the believer. The judge is on your side. Who can be against us if the judge is for us? Now, to further emphasize this point, notice verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered his own son up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You might think about it this way. Paul's saying God has already given us his utmost he didn't hold back when it came to the greatest thing he could ever give. He sacrificed his very own son that we might have life. Can you imagine any greater gift than that into an enemy no less that we were? John said, greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends and we weren't even his friends. When the judge's son was sacrificed for us, Think about that. When God gave the gift of his son, we were enemies according to the Bible. How many of us would sacrifice one of our own, one of our own offspring that an enemy of ours might live? Would you sacrifice one of your own? Well, we're not God, are we? You see, Paul's presenting a logical argument here. God has already done the greatest thing he could possibly have done on our behalf. On your behalf. Is it so much to think, Paul's saying, that having taken God at his word and having trusted in the finished cross work of his son, that God will not follow through with the purpose for which he gave his son to die for you in the first place? That's an extremely logical question. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall he not with him also freely give you all things? In other words, God has already given the greatest thing he could ever give. There isn't any reason to believe he's going to start holding back now. But I did this yesterday. That's what he gave his son for. And he's not holding back. And don't get tripped up with Paul's statement that God will freely give us all things. Some have been caught up in the foolishness of their own imaginations and they've been carried away by their own emotions mistakenly imagining that when Paul says all things here, he's referring to anything and everything we want. Not the case. That isn't Paul's point here at all. You see, some have jumped back into time, back into time past, and they've tried to apply the prayer of faith to Romans chapter 8, verse 32. That is what Paul's talking about here. This is a different dispensation. Paul has some specific things in mind here. Something in particular that he's already talked about. You see, Paul's referring to the all things he's already mentioned in the context of this epistle. The things he's mentioned in verses 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, whom he did foresee through the power of his omniscience. God knows all those are his. He also did predestinate predetermined those people that he foresaw were going to believe to be what? Saved from their sins? No. Mm -mm. That isn't what it's talking about here. Christ took care of that on the cross of Calvary for all humanity. God predestinated all believers to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, then he also called and whom he called, then he also justified and whom he justified then he also glorified. That's quite a statement. Paul's simply saying that if God came through with the gift of his son, is it not reasonable to believe that God will also come through with these other things as well? When you're standing in the court of God's justice, according to Paul's analogy, the obvious answer is of course he will. If God wants, it, wants to do it, he could, who could possibly stop him? So for the believer, there's no one able to oppose God, no one higher than God, no court higher than this court, you are standing in that courtroom and the judge is on your side and there's no effective opposition because he's not going to stop. He's not going to hold back what he has for you now. Which brings us to Paul's second conclusion. Conclusion: For the believer, there's no valid accusation that can be brought against you. For the believer, there's no valid accusation. Verse 33, who shall lay anything 
to the charge of God's elect, and it's God that justifies. You're standing in this courtroom, the judge is on your side, and there's nobody that can bring up an, opposition, uh, an opposing argument that, that could go against you because there's no valid accusation that can be made. So if you've placed yourself in this courtroom that Paul's painting and you're on trial here, this is an interesting statement. The judge is on your side. Who can possibly oppose the supreme judge of the universe? Now the apostle Paul squares his shoulder back. He gets in everyone's face as he issues a direct challenge. Picture Paul if you can here. I can picture him sort of pacing back and forth, looking around the courtroom. Go ahead, he's saying. Go for it if you think you dare. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? He's asking. It's kind of like a marriage. Speak now or forever hold your peace. And Paul's saying, Go for it if you think you dare. Who can lay any charge to God's elect? Well, tell me, who can do that? Who dares level an accusation against this individual who is in Christ Jesus? Wow. Perhaps you're looking at God. Your, your eyes go to the judge. Would God himself do that? Of course not. That would be the same as leveling a charge against his son to whom you are joined the son with whom God is well pleased according to the word of God. Remember, the judge is, is on the defense team. <laughs> He's on your side. Talk about a dream team. It is God that justifieth, Paul says. God will not level an accusation against the believer. Why, it was God himself who issued every believer a gift declaration of what? Righteousness. It is just as though you have already been tried in the mind of God, the supreme judge of the universe and God declare you to be righteous not just sinless righteous <laughs> what would it be called if God were to turn around now and make you stand trial twice for the same offense what do we call that in our country double jeopardy as most of you well know the point is the judge of the universe has already declared you to be as righteous as his very own son Christ who fulfilled how much righteousness all righteousness according to the word and he's declared you to be that degree of righteousness by attributing that which is written on the son's account to your account. Perfect righteousness. You see why the judge is on your side? The righteousness belonging to God himself is now sitting on your paper and the judge has it in front of him when he looks over the charges that are made against you. Perfect righteousness. Don't look to God to level an accusation against you now. Don't look to the judge to charge you with anything right now. I'd say you're doing pretty well so far in this trial, wouldn't you? Well, that brings us to Paul's third conclusion. For the believer, there's no valid uh, uh, um, opposition. There's no valid accusation. And number three, for the believer, there's now no condemnation. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? Another hypothetical question in Paul's analogy. If God will not condemn you, who could? Who would possibly have that right? Well, who's left? God would not condemn you. He gave his son for you. Would another human being have the right to condemn you in this trial? No. Why? Because they're in the same boat you are in. They're under sin themselves. So if they would have no right whatsoever to condemn you or anyone else for that matter, but there is one individual who would condemn you. That one other individual would be, and he would have the right, the Lord Jesus Christ. He would have the right to condemn you because he lived a perfect life. He had no sin of his own. He lived in such a way that he can now stand and pass judgment if he so chooses. He is the only legitimate one to be able to pass judgment that remains. Paul's hypothetical question is, would Christ condemn you? Paul answers that absurdity in the remainder of the verse. It is Christ <laughs> that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Look at all that Christ has done on your behalf, on my behalf. Paul is saying, he died for you. In other words, he loved you enough to die in your place, taking your sins upon himself in order to spare you from condemnation in this, judge, in this courtroom. And he rose again for your justification. If you don't think that was sufficient to keep Christ from leveling a charge against you, look at the remainder of Paul's statement there in verse 34. It is Christ who died for you and rose again, Paul said, and it was Christ who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. What a remarkable and astounding proclamation Paul's just made. Paul's saying to you, as you stand before the judicial bench of God's justice, 
Look up and open your eyes, he's saying. Who is it that you see at the bench? I'm sure you see the supreme judge of the universe sitting there. You see him. We've been talking about him. But who is that that is with him? Who is that seated at his right hand in this courtroom? Why, it's none other than Jesus Christ himself, the one that died for you, the one that's making intercession for you. Christ is seated at the right hand of the judge. And he's not just seated there, he's doing something. You see, the right hand of God is a position of authority in the Bible. But Paul's telling us here that the only one who can rightly occupy the highest position of authority, the right hand of God, is Christ. Paul wants us to understand that Christ has a lot of clout when it comes, comes to this supreme judge of the universe. The question is, how is God using his authority here in the courtroom? Well, the answer there is he's using that authority to make intercession for us. What? He's actually interceding on our behalf? In other words, he's speaking on your behalf in his courtroom? You see Paul's point? In Paul's courtroom analogy, he's saying Christ would not condemn you because Christ is performing in his courtroom in a very special way. Christ has taken on the role and he's acting as your defense attorney. You see it? He's stepping in, so to speak, to defend you. How would you like to have a defense attorney like that? Well, if you're a believer, you've got one, according to the Apostle Paul, what he's telling us here in Romans 8. You see, while God would, condemn, would not condemn you because he's on your side, while other human beings cannot condemn you because they have no right, they're in the same boat you and I are in, and while Christ would have the right to condemn you because... God has made him judge of the living and the dead. Christ has taken on the role as your defense attorney. Talk about a dream team. So there's only one other being in the world who could condemn you and would condemn you, I should, would say, not could, but would. And that one is constantly ready and willing to bring charges against you before God. Who do you suppose that one would be? You guessed it, Satan. Paul's telling us here that Satan, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, loves nothing better than to present a list of charges against believers. Against you if you're a believer. And Satan could point his bony finger at each and every one of us and he could accuse us before God. But Christ, acting as our defense attorney, is right there to intercede because Christ can present himself to the judge as living evidence that our sin debt has been fully paid and taken care of. The debt's already been paid. Christ is the evidence and he's alive and he's sitting at the right hand of the judge in this analogy. Your sin debt has been fully paid and the payment has already been accepted as sufficient by the supreme judge sitting behind the bench. See what Paul's doing here as he's painting this picture for us? Now let's take a remaining few minutes and look at Paul's fourth conclusion for every believer. There is no effective opposition. There is no valid accusation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And last but not least for the believer... There is no separation. Romans 8, 35 and 36. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Well, that would be pain, anguish, worry, misery, trouble, severe pressure. Can tribulation mean that God is not on your side? Not at all. Distress, meaning grief, sorrow, sadness, sickness, mental anguish, suffering. When we're in distress, does that mean that God's forsaken us? Or that somehow we've fallen out of God's favor? Someone would want us to believe that as he's standing in this courtroom accusing us. Not on your life, Paul's telling us. Better yet, not on Christ's life. <laughs> persecution, meaning aggravation, intimidation, torment, even to the point of torture. That's persecution. Can persecution separate us from the love of Christ? Paul's saying, not a chance. Famine? Lack? Scarcity? Shortage? Undersupply? All the things the world will look at and say, God must be angry. He must be teaching you a lesson. Or surely you poor soul must have done something to raise God's ire. Can you think back to Job in this case? You've done something to incite God's wrath, else God wouldn't have removed his blessing from you. You know, we don't need others to say that. We say that against ourselves sometimes. We say that God is good, do we not, in the midst of our abundance and our joy and our happiness. Paul's telling us that God is just as good, just as happy with a believer who's in dire need as he is with a believer in his bounty. Nakedness, unclothed, uncovered, exposed to the elements, exposed to the world. 
how quickly we are to judge God's blessings into proportion to the absence of things that we feel like we lack. Paul's revealing here, then he mentions peril or sword, danger, threat, violence, brutality, abuse, those things which represent the power to take physical life even. I believe Paul's demonstrating something very important by presenting this long list right here in the middle of this courtroom analogy. You see, any one of those things could be offered up as evidence that God is not on our side if Satan wanted to do that. Wow. That God's angry. That he's come dis become displeased with you because of something you did or are doing. He's become alienated. We've become alienated with the one who is in the midst of, or he's become alienated with the one who's in the midst of such dire situations. And what would outside people say as they begin to play assistant Holy Spirit? Yeah, you've done something wrong, which is what they were doing with Job, wasn't it? Paul's point here is that the evidence of suffering as it pertains to the believer can be thrown out of court as inadmissible evidence. That's what he's just told us. Because believers are called to undergo such things as Paul's just listed. It's all part of the sin-cursed world in which everyone lives. Believers and non-believers alike. Satan works through the events of this sin-cursed world to do what? Defeat us, if he can. To defeat Christians. To get them down on themselves and down on everybody else. And down on God, ultimately. That's what his desire is. To make us feel emotional. To make us feel that God's far removed from us that we are now separated from him and we need to get back on his team. Paul's saying to the onlookers in this courtroom, when you see the evidence of suffering in the life of a believer, you can count that suffering as evidential proof of that believer's relationship with God. Why? In Romans 8, verse 36, Paul quoted David in Psalms 44, as written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul was speaking of himself here and his co-workers primarily, but to us secondarily. Makes no difference what dispensation we live in. God's people share one thing in common. Paul tells us what that is in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. <laughs> For unto you it is given in behalf, on behalf or in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Wow. So the people of God have suffered in the past. The fact is, the people of God will suffer in time future. The fact is, the people of God are suffering today. <laughs> Satan uses that suffering as evidence to defeat us and to convince us and the world that God's alienated from us. God is using that evidential, as evidential proof that we enjoy an inseparable relationship with Him because He uses suffering to increase our hope. And our hope, when put on display in the midst of our troubling circumstances, is evidence to the world of a relationship with God. Paul showing the onlookers in this courtroom illustration that the evidence is overwhelmingly in our favor. <laughs> in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Paul says, Nay. Na, 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 na. Nay, in no way, in all these things, Paul's telling us, we are what? We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not through us or what we do or what we don't do. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Who shall separate us? from the love of Christ, from the love of the one who's acting in our as our defense attorney in this courtroom of the Ancient of Days justice in Paul's analogy. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, all the heavenly authorities, nor things present, things you might be going through right now, nor things to come, no matter how bad things could possibly get in the future, nor height, nor depth. There's nowhere you could possibly go to be separated from God, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This judge is not going to change his mind. He's not going to reverse things. He's not going to hold back based on your behavior that he had his son take on himself and die for before you ever drew a breath. For those who would say, you can break your relationship, you can break your fellowship with God, you can't lose your salvation. I heard it growing up. But you can certainly lose your fellowship with God, and for that, you'll need an additional forgiveness in order to restore that fellowship. What a smoke-laden lie that is. Paul would say, hog bathwater. <laughs> so as the Apostle Paul looks at our case, at our courtroom trial, he carefully considers all the evidence that's been presented. 
Wow. He looks at the judge's attitude toward us. He looks at Jesus Christ's attitude, our defense attorney. And Paul comes to a conclusion, a conclusion here. This individual is absolutely, positively safe and free from judgment. This individual cannot be separated in any form or fashion now nor evermore from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Our relationship is unconditional, it's unalterable, and it's unending. Paul's final two words, case closed. Let's end it there, look to the Lord, and we'll let you go with just a few minutes early today. Stay tuned for next week, who you think you are. <laughs> uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much that in spite of who we are, you made us everything complete as we are joined to your Son. We thank you for a salvation and a, a glorification that we could never have imagined, dreamed up, or accomplished no matter what man tries to do. We could do nothing. We stand before you hat in hand, nothing else, and we throw the hat aside. We can't bring our little red wagon full of all the things we thought we did and take self-glory for or praise in. We stand there naked before you, guilty. And we thank you that you look at us because you've placed us into the person of your son, joined us to him, and we could stand there with nothing and you could say, as righteous as I am myself. Wow, who could have ever supposed such a thing? Forgiving, forgiving us for our sins was a major thing that you did for us. But you didn't stop by just forgiving us our sins. You then glorified us. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. Grace is giving us much more than we could ever deserve. We thank you so much for that. I thank you so much for these folks and for their graciousness to me, allowing me to come in and speak before them on Sunday mornings. Oh, I love them. Bless them, Lord, and bless this fellowship that they're in that you might give the increase here. Grow these people up, not only internally here, grow what's here up, but that others might come in and too be grown up likewise, seeing the love here that they might want what these people have. Thank you so much for them. Thank you so much for your word so that we can all grow and be established in this wonderful gospel called the gospel of Christ, the message of reconciliation has been committed to us to take out to the world. Thank you for all these things. And may these people realize that because of who they are, who you've made them to be in your son, that that means the next shoe is about to drop as they will become attacked by who we don't know, by what way we don't know, but the attack keeps coming because Satan won't let up. He would defeat every one of us, help them not to be defeated, but to stand strong in the faith they have. And the word is it establishes them and they study it to be established. Thank you so much for all you've done for us, for who you are, for who you've made us to be in your son. For you give all the praise and the glory belongs to you and to the son of yours who gave us life on our behalf. We thank you for all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.